happy Mother's Day. I, I, I took a preaching class one time, and, and uh, they said, woe to the preacher that does not reference moms on Mother's Day. Um, it's, uh, that's probably the only thing I remember from that class, but that alone is worth its weight in gold. Um, I, uh, my son's turned one this month, and so I've, I've had the, the, uh, the opportunity as a, as a husband and a father to have like a really unique perspective on, um, on what a mom's job actually is, and actually... Um, all weekend long, my son's been running a fever of like up to 104, and so my wife's not even here today. She's, she's actually at the pediatrician. She scheduled an appointment this morning because he can't kick it. Um, he, he can't kick that fever, but I remember when I was in the fire department, they told us that you never stop being a firefighter, and I think, uh, man, I think that's like even more so true for being a mom. I don't, uh, I, it's not something that you turn off. It's just a it's a job that, that's never ending, and I, I, you know, just from my outsider's perspective, it just looks like mothering is, is one of the hardest, but one of the most important jobs in the world, and you have such a tremendous impact on your, uh, on your kids, and, and I, you know, I imagine it's just a job and, and a calling that's wrought with discouragement, um, but I hope you keep your head up and you realize exactly what kind of impact and how much it means to your kids when you pour your life into them, so thanks a lot, moms. All right. So today we're in week five of our series out of the book of Acts called The Roots, and we've covered a great deal of ground so far, so real quick, I'm going to try to get us up to speed with what's, uh, with what's going on. So during his ministry, Jesus prophesied that he'd build something called the church, and the book of Acts is the story of the fulfillment of that promise. And so what, where we've kind of been so far in Acts chapter 2, you read, on the day of Pentecost that the church was born and God created by sending his spirit to dwell inside of his people. That's really what the church is. And then uh, the, the, the week after that, we were in Acts 3 and 4, and what we kind of focused on that week was exactly what the church is called to look like in the culture in which God places it, how we interact with the people outside our four walls. Um, if you were here last week, what we looked at was really how we never outgrow the need for God and how the church is constantly really with, with our every breath dependent on our God for, for everything that we are. And we, we focused on three specific things that God does for us. Number one, God develops us. He, he makes us into people that we can never be uh, simply by our own strength. He makes us more like himself. Uh, secondly, God purifies his people, and he's willing to cause us uh, great pain if that's what's necessary in order to rid us of the things that would otherwise destroy us or harm us. And thirdly, last week, we saw that God sustains his people, and we can root ourselves in the confidence that if the mission that we are on is God's mission, then the obstacles in our path are God's to deal with, which is comforting because he's a whole lot better at dealing with them than we are. Amen? Amen. So that brings us to where we are today, to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And, and while you're turning there, I spent a great deal uh, this week just looking over and looking over and looking over this text and asking God why he saw fit to include it in his word and, and what we would miss if, uh, if he had not done so. And um, this week's text is about something that you personally have experienced in your life. You, all things considered, probably are dealing with it today. Uh, and if, if by some miracle you're not, then you're getting ready to deal with it very soon. All right, there's a saying that there's two things in life are guaranteed. What are they? <laughs> Death and taxes. Amen. That's, uh, that's not a wrong statement. We should expect those. I do think it's an incomplete statement because I can guarantee you at least three things in your life. Death, taxes, and here it is, conflict. Amen. amen. Yeah, I thought I'd get a couple amens on that one. Conflict. <laughs> Nothing but conflict. The um, Bible says man is born to trouble like sparks fly upwards. In other words, get ready for conflict. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, conflict has a funny way of revealing who we actually are, and more often than not, I just don't like what it reveals about me. <laughs> and maybe you can sympathize with that. Um, but as people that are filled with the, with the Holy Spirit of God and called to be you know, ever-changing into his likeness, I am convinced more so than ever that conflict inside the family of God should look different than conflict anywhere else on the planet. Amen. And so, um, so what, this, what this text and what this teaching is going to do for you and I, hopefully, is uh, number one, it's going to tell us the reality of conflict that, frankly, I find very encouraging. Number two, it's going to give us the solution to conflict. So how about that? After today, you never have a problem again. <laughs> and, and, uh, and number three, it's going to tell us a positive outcome uh, worth pursuing and worth giving ourselves to if we're willing to walk through conflict like the men and women of God that he's called us to be. How's that sound? All right, let's get it. It's Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And what we read is, in those days, as the numbers... 
of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said it would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to handle financial matters. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the preaching about God flourished, the number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. So the first thing that's very evident to me about this text, whether we like it or not, is my first point today, and that is community creates conflict. Community creates conflict. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me just read verse 1 that, in my opinion, very clearly states that. It says, In those days, as the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. And so, <laughs> community creates conflict. The Bible says, Where two or more are gathered, the Lord's there. I would also say, Where two or more are gathered, conflict's coming. <laughs> Um, and, and that could seem like kind of discouraging to you, but that's actually uplifting to me, and that may admittedly be because I'm a strange dude, but I find freedom in that, and here's why, here's why, because I think there's a tendency to read that book that God so graciously gave us, and to think as we read about the men and women, uh, you know, as we turn the pages that God decided to use, I think it's real easy for us to read uh, our assumptions onto those people and to believe that the people in the Bible were somehow less human than you and I are. And they didn't really struggle with the things that you and I do and they were just kind of holier than us or bulletproof saints or whatever you want to call them. And that is very simply not the case. The story of the Bible is not the story of really good people working their way to God. The story of the Bible is a really good God working his way to really bad people. Amen? And uh, I can prove that. I can prove that. So let me, let me just walk through a few scenarios that may very well uplift some of us this morning. So take the story of Noah. All right, Noah is an incredibly, incredibly faithful man, hadn't even reigned on the earth in Noah's day, and God came to him one day and said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need you to build a boat because it's going to rain like it's never rained before. And, and the boat, by the way, this isn't like some kind of 10-foot schooner or something. If you, if, you can check this out later today. If you check the flagpole in our front yard here and run it to home plate on our softball field, that's the dimension of the ark's length. So it took Noah months and months and months to build uh, this boat, when people in his day probably, actually definitely thought that he was crazy, but Noah did so simply because he was a faithful man. And if that's all we knew about Noah, then the tendency would probably be for us to say, well, I guess we have to be you know, totally faithful all the time in order for God to use us. But if you read the story of Noah, you will also read that after he stepped off the ark, safe and sound from the deluge that was the flood, he got hammered drunk and made a fool of himself in front of his children. I find that refreshing. <laughs> because, because my son's not even one year old yet, and I have made a fool of myself in front of him. And I'm probably going to do it a few more times before he moves on out the house, okay? Maybe it's just me. I feel kind of judged right now, but I think if you're being honest, you could probably say amen to that. Same thing with Abraham. Abraham's a story of a man, uh, you wrote, read about him in Genesis chapter 12, 75 years old, and he uprooted and left everything that he knew behind. I mean, those were the golden years. Those are the years that you're supposed to run out the clock in peace, maybe move to Florida or whatever seems like a good idea to you. Abraham had it made. I mean, he had servants who had servants. He had money. He had camels. He had the whole thing. Uh, and God came to him one day and says, start moving. And Hebrews tells us he didn't even know where he was going. He just put one foot in front of the other because he believed that a life of service to God was better than a life of service to himself. Incredibly inspirational figure. But again, Hold a magnifying glass. This one's not as funny to me. Hold a magnifying glass to Abraham, and you'll read not once but twice, that dude abandoned his wife. 
in, in one of the most cowardly ways I can imagine. Because twice Abraham was afraid for his life and so he lied to, to actually kings and rulers in his day and said, that's not my wife, she's my sister. Because he didn't want to get killed because she was good looking. And so uh, he allowed other men to take his wife from him. I have no idea how Abraham ever looked his wife in the eye after that. But what I do know is that God used him. And that's encouraging to me. It's no different with every story that we read about in the Bible. God's not waiting for perfect people to serve him. Uh, God's waiting for people to realize they need a really perfect God worth serving. Amen? And so in case, you know, we've been, we've been running through Acts now for, for five weeks. In case you've been hearing these stories and thinking like, man, that, that New Testament church was just full of faith, hope, and love. And people are walking on water on the way out the door and nobody ever had a problem. This text dismantles that delusion for you and I. And the conflict that they dealt with in the church in Acts chapter 6 was not small potatoes. Not sm- what does that even mean, small potatoes? It was medium-sized potatoes. I don't even know what that means. So, so it wasn't small potatoes. It was potatoes to be reckoned with. And, um, and, the, and the conflict that, that basically arose in the church, it was the result of you had a church that experienced explosive growth. Okay, And as a result of that, people from different walks of life and different mindsets and ways of living were now in close proximity to each other and, and uh, interacting with one, each other, uh, one another. And historically, that absolutely always leads to friction. So the, uh, the, the complaint and the friction that we read about was between two groups of people, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Now, who were they? The Hebraic Jews were extremely traditional, kind of held to the old ways prescribed by their fathers uh, in the Old Testament, and and Hellenistic Jews were the opposite. Hellenistic Jews had been scattered throughout the ancient world, and the ancient world was in their day heavily dominated by Greek influence, and so they spoke a different language. They were primarily Greek-speaking Jews. They uh, they lived differently. They talked differently. They, um, They had different style, different taste in music. They were very much influenced by the culture, whereas Hebraic Jews were like like think like almost like the Amish. They were very ethnocentric and almost isolationist in the way that they did life. And so you had competing ideals and, and, and really like a cultural clash and sure enough it generated friction. So what Hellenistic Jews would do often in this day, uh, a Hellenistic Jewish couple toward the end of their life would make a pilgrimage from wherever they were, Egypt or, or Rome or what have you, and they would go to the holy city Jerusalem to kind of run out the clock and die in the holy city. And so what would often happen is that men died before their wives, and so the, 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 uh, the wives would be left to, uh, as widows, and, and uh, the church would have to take care of them. And so some theologians believe that there were as many as like 500 to 1,000 widows in this church at this time. And so the complaint was the Hebraic widows are getting taken care of really well. Like they don't have a need. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like, uh, the, the, the priority of the church, whereas the Hellenistic widows were more of like an afterthought, and, and sometimes they went without in the daily distribution of food and or clothing. Now, maybe you're starting to recognize this. That had the potential, um, that would had the potential to actually rip the church apart. And, um, I mean, this was like a, a cauldron of conflict that could have sort of erupted and split the church in half. Now, um, before I get into how this conflict died down and what we can learn, let me make a few Let me make a few uh, comments about conflict. First, conflict is not necessarily, I say necessarily, it's not necessarily the result of wrongdoing in our life. It's not necessarily the result of sin, and it's not necessarily synonymous with failure. Because as we read this text, the Bible never even hints that the apostles did anything wrong. Never says that they intentionally overlooked the Hellenistic Jews. They never needed to apologize or repent or anything like that. And I bring that up because I think the tendency a lot of times in our lives is to look at a problem or a conflict that arises and assume that we must have done something wrong. And, and then the, So the antithesis of that mindset is if I just do everything right, if I just live a perfect enough life, then I'm never going to have any conflict. That's absolutely not the case. Just absolutely not the case. And, and, and so like what we see more often than not in our culture is there's conflict in a marriage and so somebody decides to roll out. There's conflict in a church and so somebody decides to roll out or conflict in any area of your life. And, and, and a lot of times it's easy for us to sort of just uproot and believe that if we change our external circumstances, we're not going to experience any hardship or conflict. Not the truth. So, so conflict is not necessarily the result of, of, of sin. I mean, it, it certainly can be. The Bible says the way of the sinner is hard on himself. But just because there's conflict does not mean that, that you've necessarily failed somewhere. And actually, conflict can be a catalyst for great growth in your and my life if handled 
correctly. The, the, the danger, the problem associated with conflict is that because we're fallen creatures, more often than not, we, we handle it poorly. And then something, a, a situation that could actually um, yield increase in our life instead stunts our growth. So what, what I want to do here, and I, admittedly I'm generalizing, but I'm going to give us two very equally wrong ways to deal with conflict. And I'm willing to bet that everyone here falls in one or uh, uh, either of one of these categories, okay? Two wrong ways to deal with conflict. Number one is what I affectionately refer to as the ostrich defense. <laughs> think about it, think about it. So you see where I'm going with this. I know God has a sense of humor because he designed an ostrich. And ostriches, what they'll do whenever something threatens them is bury their head in the dirt, believing that, uh, I guess, danger is just a figment of their imagination, and if they can't see or hear it, it's not going to get them, which I'm sure has been the demise of many an ostrich. Many an ostrich. All right, so maybe you're like this. Maybe you know somebody that's like this, that at the first sign of conflict, you just kind of ignore it and put your head in the sand and hope that if you, if you don't acknowledge it, then it's going to go away. Spoiler alert, that never, ever works. Uh, you probably know that if you've tried, if you've tried to uh, practice that. Don't be like the ostrich, all right? It's, uh, it's not going to work. And, and, and the apostles knew this. I bring that up because the apostles knew this. And in verse 2, it tells us that they didn't operate that way. It says, at the very first hearing of this complaint, of this conflict, verse 2 says, then the 12, the 12 apostles, summoned the whole company of the disciples. Okay, so they didn't try to pretend like there wasn't really an issue. They knew that it was worth uh, addressing. And to not address it would have just caused it to spread. And... Um, you know, more often than not, when we choose not to address something, it just takes a problem and turns it into an emergency, and then if left unchecked, it'll be a catastrophe on down the road. So the apostles knew this, they address it. Now, that's one wrong way to, to handle conflict. Um, if that doesn't speak to you, I bet the other side of the spectrum does, because the other end of the spectrum of, of the uh, uh, ostrich defense mechanism is to go way overboard, way, and I mean way overboard with conflict. And, and this sort of mindset, usually when a problem arises, you wind up giving a whole lot more weight to a problem than it's actually worth, and you allow it to rock your boat, and you kind of lose your mind, and, and, you, and you wind up going from fire to fire trying to put them out in your life. And what happens is the conflicts in your life totally throw your priorities, and you essentially become like a problem firefighter. And the issue with that is we're never going to stop experiencing conflict. So if our life is one problem to the next, then you're never really going to move in any direction, certainly not the direction that God has for you. Amen? The apostles knew this as well, and so in verse, uh, the second half of verse 2, this is what they said. So they get the whole uh, congregation together, they address the problem, but then here's what they have to say. They say, it would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to handle financial matters. So the apostles knew very well that they had a calling on their lives and they had a role to play in God's kingdom, and so they needed to address this problem, but it could not throw them from the call that God had on their life. There's a lesson there, all right? There's a middle ground there that's very wise. So... That leaves us with the question, how did the early church deal with conflict and what are we to learn from it? That is answered in verse 3. Here's what it says they, they, uh, they did. Verse 3 says, Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And that, uh, that leads me to my second point today, that contribution corrects conflict. Now let me say that again. Contribution corrects conflict. So here's what we read in those verses. First off, the apostles contributed to the problem, uh, uh, rather to the solution. And, and it, it's, it's kind of, to read this text, it's kind of, it might look on, on the surface like the apostles just sort of abdicated their role and said, we're not going to deal with that. That's not what happened here. Here's what, here's what you and I see most of the time in leadership in our culture. And here's what the apostles could have done. They could, they could have held a press conference and sort of addressed the people and said, listen, you just don't know how difficult leadership is. We got all kinds of responsibilities and plates in the air and those, those Greek widows aren't even making their need known. It's on them. How, we can't read minds. They could have tried to like, you know, play the blame game or, or they could have 
tried to you know, play victims, but either, either of those approaches would have been futile. And so what they did instead was very proactively address the people, and they said, listen, uh, it, it would be wrong for us to abandon our role uh, and, and our ministry of, of praying and preaching, and so what we need is for you guys to let seven men that are known to be trustworthy, are known to have rock-solid character to rise to the surface and handle this need. That was an incredibly proactive approach that the apostles um, Uh, practice there, and they contributed to the solution of the problem rather than just saying, hey, this isn't ours to deal with. But the the other side of of the equation here, the seven men that were chosen to serve, is kind of the twist in this story. Because what, what we find, if you do a little bit of research here, is that all seven of the names of the men that stepped up to serve, every one of them had a Greek name. Meaning all of the people that that, um, wound up working toward the solution of this problem were in fact the people that were angry about the problem. That really challenged me this week because, like, try to put yourself in the shoes of the Hellenistic Jews here. And, 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 I mean, ask yourself this. If it was your widowed mother who was consistently not getting taken care of in the church, uh, you know, maybe if it happened once, maybe if it happened for one week, okay, they just had an off week, maybe if it happened two or three times, they're having a rough month, but this is consistently the Hellenistic widows were getting neglected. If that was my mom, I, do, I don't really care whether the church intentionally did it or not. I'd be fired up. And I think if you're being honest, you'd be fired up too. And here's what you and I would probably see in most churches today. And we read about this all the time. You'd probably see a church split over something like this. Right? Because churches split over whether the carpet's the wrong color or not. Uh, honestly. And this is a huge, like, cultural, you know, sort of race-driven, like, this could have absolutely split the church wide open, and you would have had the first Greek Church of Christ on one side of the street, and the first Hebraic Church of Christ on the other side, and they would have been giving each other the stink eye, driving into worship services, and keying each other's cars, and preaching against each other, and they would have completely forgot that there's a culture outside the four walls of the church that need to hear Jesus, all right, and, and I'm convinced what would have happened if the church would have dealt with it that way and, you know, there would have been an uprising and it would have splintered. What would have happened is the enemy, Satan, would have sat back and crossed his arms and laughed like he does when Christians are locking horns with each other and forgetting about the mission that God has placed them on. And so... I'm glad you're fired up. I'm fired up too. And so in, instead of, of playing that nonsense and that foolish game of, you know, dividing the, the body of Christ and forgetting about the reason why we exist and why God filled us with the spirit and the mission that he put us on, these seven individuals that the way that I read the story had every right to be angry instead said, we see a need and there's a reason that we see it. So they stepped up to work toward the solution of the problem. That's cool, and that's the way that that, that God's people are called to deal uh, with with conflict. Now, notice this. The contribution of the apostles looked a whole lot different than the contribution of the seven men chosen to serve. And depending on what responsibilities God has for you in your life right now, depending on the calling that he has on your life, your contribution to the conflicts that you arrive in are going to look different. But rest assured, every conflict has eventually been resolved because somebody decided to contribute rather than contribute plain. Amen? And after studying this this week, I'm convinced more so than ever that in times of great conflict, God's people are called to distinguish distinguish themselves by contributing rather than complaining. I don't care what role we have in the body of Christ or how long we've been saved or what we think we have figured out or not figured out. We are not called to stand on the sideline because man's natural way, man's natural way with issues like this, and you and I see it on the news all the time, is to stand outside of a problem and throw rocks at it. I mean, like watch the news one time. I mean, honestly, watch the news one time, and here's what's going to happen. There's some incredibly dangerous, multifaceted, layered conflict that goes on. We just saw one recently, and here's what will happen. Somebody on behalf of one team will look at the problem and say, well, here's the core issue, and here's how the leadership completely blew it, and here's what I would have done. And then you'll have somebody from, you know, the other team say, well, that's not, this is the real core issue, and that's what those people really did wrong, and that's what I would have done if I was in leadership, and that's why all those people should be fired. Meanwhile, there's still a fire to put out. Like, there comes a time when we need to stop diagnosing how a fire started and just say, it's still burning, somebody needs to do something. Because standing outside of a conflict and throwing rocks at it might be the easy way to go through life, it's just not the Christian way to go through life. Can I get an amen? So consider what this book is actually teaching us. The farther we zoom out from the word of God and the farther we look at the meta narrative or the big picture story found in the word of God, if I could just summarize it, here's what this book teaches us. 
We had a problem we couldn't solve, and God, for some reason, came down here and solved it for us. That's what the Bible teaches. And here's what God could have done. Here's what our God absolutely would have been well within his right to do. Could have sat up in heaven and looked down on earth and wrote a running commentary on the stupidity of mankind, which he would still be writing because we give him more than enough material. God could have sat up in heaven and said, oh, their real problem is they just won't accept responsibility for anything. Because ever since Genesis chapter 3, we've been trying to blame somebody else for our problems when they're our problems to own. Adam said, oh, it was my wife's fault. The wife said, oh, it's the snake's fault. Meanwhile, it's our responsibility. God could have sat up in heaven and said, oh, well, mankind's real problem is they find all kinds of reasons to divide rather than unite. And they're stubborn and they're prideful and they never learn from their mistakes. He could have done that. But what we read, praise God, what we read instead is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God the Son came down here and put on flesh. He lived among us. He taught us how to live. He loved on us. And Jesus' act of, of contribution was actually the greatest act of contribution that settled the greatest conflict in history, which was the conflict between God and man. Thank God that our God is a God that contributed rather than standing on the sidelines and complaining. All right, so if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is and you're wondering where you actually stand with God, I, I actually have bad news for you. Uh, the Bible tells us very clearly that we're not good people. They don't exist. They've never existed. They never will exist. There was one good person. His name was Jesus, and he got murdered for being a good person. Uh, we are actually at odds with God in our natural state. Okay, the Bible says that none is righteous, not even one. We like sheep have gone astray, but that's, that's the bad news. The good news is that Jesus came down here, lived a perfect life for you and I, died an atoning death for you and I, and rose again. And he said if anyone gives their life to him, if anyone bows their knee to him, asks him for forgiveness and salvation and dedicates their life to following him, then we can be made right with God. That's what we call the gospel in the Christian community. That's a really good story. That's really good news. But praise God that our God was a contributor rather than a complainer. So let me, let me bring this to the ground level. Let me just ask you, what would it look like? I, li I like to you know, like take a passage of Scripture and almost try to like cast a vision for somebody's life because that's, how, that's what I've been thinking about this week. And so what would it look like if you and I, the next time we find ourselves in a conflict, which all things considered is probably going to be about 30 minutes from now, the way that our lives go. Let's get real. Then what would happen if the next time you and I find ourselves in the middle of a conflict, instead of operating in man's natural way, which is to either play the victim or justify ourselves and condemn the actions of another and diagnose the cause of the fire instead of actually putting it out, what would happen if the next time there's a conflict in your marriage, in your family, within yourself, in your relationship with God or at work or your ministry or wherever it is, what if the first question you asked is how can I contribute in order to put this conflict to rest? I'll tell you what would happen, you'd look a whole lot more like Jesus, and that should be the name of the game for you and I, amen? amen. So let's look at what happened when the church did this. I find it in verse 7. It says, so the preaching about God flourished. It tells us three, three things that happened because this church handled conflict like men and women of God are called to. It says, so the preaching about God flourished, the number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. That brings me to my third and final point today. Increase can come from conflict. Now, I, I had to word it this way. I almost said increase comes from conflict. Uh, but, but frankly, no, it doesn't. Not all the time. Okay? Because there's a lot of, a lot of conflicts I've been in uh, that have been the result of my own foolishness. And we're not, we shouldn't expect to see a whole lot of increase. Like I said earlier, Proverbs tells us that the way of the sinner is hard on himself or herself. And so, you know, if our conflict is a result of us rebelling against God, the only increase you're probably going to see from that is, okay, I shouldn't do that again. Now I know what not to do. But increase, when we handle it like men and women of God, I'm, I'm convinced that on the other side of conflict, on the other side of conflict is increase if we're willing to keep our eyes on the Lord. And so what you see in this passage, and, and what we're going to see in the next coming weeks, is that this movement called Christianity was getting ready to explode. And here's the thing. None of the people in the church in Acts 1 through, uh, 1 through 6, in the middle of that problem, 
Uh, none of them had any idea what God was just getting ready to do in their lives. But, but in the next coming verses, which we're going to look at in the next couple weeks, this thing called Christianity completely exploded from its epicenter in Jerusalem to the surrounding regions in Judea and Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth because nothing can stop God's plan. But if these people, man, I, I, like, I'm so convinced of this, we read three things happened because they walked through this conflict like men and women of God. We read that the preaching about God flourished, the disciples multiplied, and it even says that priests became obedient to the faith. And, and listen, if you're in the middle of a conflict today, and, and maybe it's been droning on for way too long, and you're wondering where God is, and you're wondering how God could possibly use the situation that you're in, let me put a bug in your ear here. Just last week, if you were here, we actually read that no one would dare join the church. They were honestly like terrified to do so after God killed Ananias and Sapphira. But then what we read after Acts uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, is that a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I am convinced the reason that they did that was because, remember, the church was meeting in the temple complex alongside the priestly system. I'm convinced that those priests gave Christianity a shot because they looked at how the people of God handled conflict in their lives, and they were forced to come to the realization that there's something different about those people. And so here's, here's what I have for you if you're walking through a conflict and you have no idea how God could use it. Listen, you have no idea, you have no idea the people that you're ministering to by walking through hardship with your eyes on God. You have no idea how many people you're preaching a sermon to by refusing to take the easy way out and keeping your eyes on the Lord. And I'm convinced that so many times, because I've seen it happen in retrospect, hindsight's always 2020. I'm convinced that so many times in my life and in our lives, we allow conflict to paralyze us and to sabotage our effectiveness for God when that conflict could very well be a catalyst by which God produces something unique and great in us for his glory and, and that conflict can be a catalyst by which we're used mightily by God. Amen? I was, I, I've, I've talked about this a few times before but I was thinking about this this week and it, um, I was a firefighter for four years before I came on as a pastor and it's amazing to me in hindsight all the things that God showed me during that time that I didn't even realize he was teaching me. Has that ever happened? Like you look back on a period of your life and it's like man that's what God was showing me. Like no time, I'm just convinced, no time is wasted in the kingdom of God. Um, I remember one of like the first days of the academy, one of our instructors told us what our job actually was. And the job description of a firefighter is not what I thought. It's not put out fires and you know, pick people up off the floor or whatever. It's none of that. The job description of a firefighter was to think and act rationally for people who had lost the ability to do so. So think about that. When you, uh, when you or someone else picks up the phone and dials 911, you've done so because there is a situation that you deem an emergency in your life. Whether that's somebody has broken something or someone's in cardiac arrest or a house is on fire, inevitably what an emergency is, is, is it's a situation where you've lost the ability to think and act rationally. And so um, basically what the fire department does is they take control of your life. They take the reins of your life until that emergency is resolved and then we give it back. That's basically what it is. It, you're, you're being paid to take control of other people's problems and bring them to a hopefully peaceful solution. Now, what that means is, and, and, and what's, this is quantifiable. They also told us this in the academy. The fire department has a tendency to draw people that are known as type A individuals. All right, type A individuals are incredibly difficult to deal with. Let's just get real. I'm one of them, so no judgment. My wife will tell you this. I'm a type A individual. Type A individuals like to take charge, and they have a tendency to be kind of arrogant because they like to think that their way is the best way and everybody else is wrong and everything needs to be their idea. This is literally almost what the entirety of the fire department is made up of, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a cauldron of conflict that's constantly erupting over the dumbest things in the world. Like, I could tell you stories of just ridiculousness that happens in a firehouse. But here's what I noticed during my four years in the firehouse. When, when, whenever we would be in the throes of some, and we always were, there was always some problem between somebody that never got resolved. But here's what I noticed. When a call came in because somebody's house was on fire or somebody needed us for something, we all instinctively put that to rest for the time being because there was a call that we had to respond to that was more important than the conflict that we were in. You see where I'm going with that? And think about how ridiculous it would be if the firefighters got a call that said, hey, somebody's house is on fire, and they said, we're actually having a rough day, hard pass. 
Hard pass on that. Uh, get a super soaker, see what you can do, maybe turn the sprinkler on, I don't know what to tell you. They would get fired instantly. It had to be on, you know, Fox News and see whatever. Ridiculousness. But, but here's the thing. I think that happens to Christians all the time. Like all the time. And, and like how ridiculous is it that you and I have a mission that we're called to and a call that God has placed on our life, but we say hard pass on that, God. Hard pass. I'm kind of having a rough day. Ridiculous. You'd never do that if you were getting paid. But we're working for eternity here. We're working for crowns to lay at God's feet. And so here's what the, here's what the church, this is, I, I need you to remember this the next time you wind up in the middle of a conflict in 30 minutes or so. Here's what the church in Acts chapter 6 realized, and here's what firefighters instinctively realize. L- listen to me. The next time conflict erupts in your life, I want you to remember this phrase. I don't care if you've got to tattoo it on your brain or write it on your mirror or what. Just tell yourself this when it happens. The mission that you're on is more important than the conflict that you're in. One more time, the mission that you are on is more important than the conflict that you're in. So listen, while the worship team comes up and we close down today, that leaves us with one more question. What's the mission that you're on? Well, here's here's the vision for this church. We want to be a place where people grow in faith, find their passion, and fulfill their calling. And unfortunately for you, that ultimately is a question that only you can ask or answer for yourself what God has called you to and what mission he's placed you on. But I can give you some ideas, and I know I'm going to hit at least a few people in the chest with this. Maybe the mission that you're on is to make your family a priority because it's been a long time since they have been. I mean, that's such a tendency to put everything in front of our families. Maybe your mission is to reconnect with your wife, your husband, your kids, whatever it is. Maybe your mission is as practical and pragmatic as getting your finances under control instead of being a slave to them. That's a very biblical thing. Maybe, maybe your mission is to take your walk with God to a deeper level that you know, that you know, that you know that he's been calling you to. And maybe that means attending church more regularly, reading your Bible and praying more regularly. Maybe it means getting connected at this church at our first service team so Jake Burkhart doesn't have to do your job because we all saw that's not going to go real well. (laughs) Maybe, 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 that was hilarious by the way, I love Jake, maybe, maybe your mission is, is, is to finally build a relationship with that person that you know God brought into your life intentionally, that you know needs to hear the story of what Jesus Christ did on their behalf at a place called Calvary 2,000 years ago. Maybe that's your mission, to reach out to somebody. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and you're not sure where you stand with God, I'll just tell you what your mission is. All right, here we go. Here's the type A individual in me coming out. Your mission is to get to know Jesus. Because I know in my heart of hearts, if you get to know him, you'll fall in love with him. And when you fall in love with him, you give your life to him and he will wreck you and rebuild you in a way that you never thought possible and he will change your life in the most beautiful way imaginable. And if you don't, it, man, if you don't believe me, talk to the people at this church. We are literally a collection of testimonies of people that have ruined everything but somehow Jesus made it better. Okay, but, but here, here's the point. Regardless of what your mission is in life and the call that God's placed on your life, you and I should be as sure as the church in Acts chapter 6 is that when we move in obedience to that, conflict is coming. And I know that the enemy just lets, you know, puts those conflicts in our lives to get us off the scent, get us off the trail of God's will for our lives. I know that that's what they're there for. So remember when they come up, the mission that you're on is more important than the conflict that you're in. Because I believe that the Father's heart of God, I believe he is just on the other side of conflict saying, keep your eyes on me. Refuse to take the easy way out. Be like my son Jesus and it'll be so worth it. And it's going to be so glorious and you're going to be so proud that you did. And and so when conflict arises, we handle it like men and women of God. We pick ourselves up. We keep moving forward, and we live the lives that we're proud to hand God. Amen? All right, that's it. That's all.